Go with this one. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Good stars out there in the background. Hello. Hi. Hi, Jay. We're just about to get started. Hi, I just sent you an email to ask how to sign on, but obviously I figured it out. All good. You're all good. So if you'll just hang on there, uh, we'll get the program rolling and then we'll uh, come around to bring you in. Thanks a lot for joining us. Okay. Thanks for asking. Okay, cool. All right. Yes. Okay, here we go. All set. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Night Skies at Home. I'm Derek Pitts, Franklin Institute's Chief Astronomer, your cool astronomer, welcoming you to another one of our astronomy programs for you at home. This program is an outgrowth, really, of a program that we have been doing at the Franklin Institute every month for many years, Night Skies at the Observatory. It's a program in which we invite our guests to come down and join us at the Franklin Institute in the evening when we make use of all of the Franklin Institute's astronomy resources. That's the planetarium, the observatory. We even add telescopes on the fifth floor roof deck, all to create a wonderful evening of opportunity for people to look through telescopes at whatever is available to be seen in the night sky when you come to visit us. This is a program, as I said, that we've done monthly at the Franklin Institute for quite a long time. And uh, once we hit that bump in the road last March, March uh, 13th of 2020, with the quarantine caused by the pandemic, when we closed down the Franklin Institute, we thought we'd bring this program to you virtually so that we could continue to provide you with opportunities for quality, authentic astronomy viewing experiences, but that you could do from home. And so here we are this evening on our June 2021 edition on the verge of being able to be done with the pandemic and go back to being outside again and eventually getting back to our regular monthly programs at the Franklin Institute. So again, welcome to Night Skies at Home, the home version of the Franklin Institute's Night Skies at the Observatory program. This is the program for June 2021. We have a lot of great stuff in store for you this evening. And uh, let's get started here with just some of the things that we're going to go over tonight that I want to remind you about that are part of our program this evening. You know, what this program is really about is about helping you become a regular sky watcher, someone who can step outside and recognize what's available to be seen in the evening sky without any difficulty at all. And also, hopefully, that you will share that information with someone near, near you, someone in your family, someone in your community. Uh, in some way so that you can all enjoy the beauty of the night sky together and so that you can become regular denizens of the night sky, knowing what's there, being able to identify what's there. You can do this anywhere. You don't have to be out in the country where the sky seems to be darker. You don't have to be in any uh, exotic location. You can do this from your backyard. You can do this from your front steps. You can be out in the country. You can be in downtown center city, Philadelphia, or any urban area and that will work out just fine. You'll be able to catch some of the brightest objects in the evening sky if you're in an urban area. And if you're someplace out where the sky is much darker, you'll be able to see a lot more, but just the same, you'll be able to see plenty of really good stuff no matter where you are. So it's good for you no matter where you are. Also, if you happen to be watching this program from someplace other than the Delaware Valley where we're located here in Philadelphia, this program is going to be good for you, too, because what's available to be seen in the evening sky, for the most part, will work out just well, just, just as well for you. Now, if you happen to be up near the North Pole, well, there may be some alterations you might want to work, make, or if you're farther south toward the southern end of Argentina or South America, we might have to make some adjustments for you. But other than that, anywhere in the world around this same band of latitude, if you will, uh, you'll be in good shape for whatever we're going to talk about seeing in the evening sky tonight. Almost. There's a major change we'll talk about uh, as we talk to our guests this evening. Most and important- Derek, I can't, resist, I can't resist saying that I'm going to talk about both observing from the North Pole and from the Southern part of Argentina when we get to it. <laughs> That's great. That's our guest, Jay Pasikov, who's going to join us a little bit later. And he's been everywhere in the world. I'm going to ask him what quarter of the world he hasn't been to. But he's going to cover that, so uh, we'll get to all of that. Most important message, please get vaccinated. Please get vaccinated. It's a really, really great way to make it possible for everybody to be out, be safe, 
and enjoy being back out again. So uh, please do it for your family. If you're not going to do it for yourself, do it for your family. Uh, get yourself vaccinated. They are everywhere. As you've already heard, Dr. Jay Pasikoff is joining us tonight to talk about his experience as an eclipse chaser. And uh, he's going to help us figure out what we should be looking for next Thursday morning. You'll find out what that is all about uh, in just a few minutes. Uh, what's up in the night sky? What can we see in the evening sky at this time of this year? You know, we're just starting the summer observing season when the temperatures are nice and warm. We can be outside for a while. Fortunately, you know, we're out of quarantine now. We're about to drop the masks everywhere. So it gives us an opportunity to be out with our family and friends, enjoying being out again. And part of that is enjoying the night sky too. So what's up there that you can take a look at this summer during this observing season that you can share with us? We'll talk about that. Also, your questions. We want your astronomy questions. This is almost the most important part of the program. If you have astronomy questions, please throw them over in the comments section. And our technical director in the background, Ben Harmer, who's working with us tonight, thank you very much, Ben, will feed those uh, questions to my studio producer here, the fabulous Linda. Hi, say hi, Linda. Hi, everybody. Here she is there. She's going to pick up those questions, feed them over to me, and we'll try to answer as many of your questions as we possibly can. If it doesn't seem as if we're going to get to your question, don't worry. Keep sending them because what we'll do is I will go through the comments. And after the program, I'll find out where your question is and I'll respond. So please keep sending your questions. We want to hear from you. Also, let us know where you're uh, getting this program from. Where are you that you're looking at the night sky someplace? We want to know what you're seeing and where you are. So please join us. Let's, uh, let's just do some sky phenomenon stuff right now so we can get you oriented that way. And then we'll jump off into our special programming for tonight. So number one, let's start out with uh, the information about the sun right now. Uh, sunrise tomorrow morning is at 5.32 a.m. Ooh, sounds kind of early, doesn't it? But it's a great time to be up. There's plenty to be seen. Sunset right now is coming at about 8.25 in the evening for where we are here at this latitude. So 5.32 in the morning to 8.25 in the evening, we have lots more hours of daylight. And of course, that's going to help to build up heat. And we're going to feel that heat as the summer heat. You all know about that. Summer solstice comes on June 20th this year. It's at 1130 in the evening. Yeah, 1130 in the evening on June 20th is when we hit that summer solstice point, what we call the first day of summer. Of course, it's really just an instant in time as the Earth orbits around the sun when the Earth gets to a particular position. That's what we call summer solstice. It's when for us in the north. The sun appears highest in the sky at noon. We have the greatest number of hours of daylight. And uh, it's a cool time to sort of keep track of the sun's motion as we go through the year. And there's some other little high points, or I should say, uh, how can I describe it? Uh, the, the highway markers, roadway markers, if you will, of the Earth's orbit around the sun that we can talk about once we get close to that time of year. So when we come around to the beginning of July, we have a special day that's going to be almost right on top of uh, when this program airs next, the first Thursday in July. We have a special milestone, a milepost, if you will, of the Earth's orbit around the sun that we can talk about then. Uh, the moon right now is a waning crescent, right? So it's rising very late at night. In fact, it's best to see it in the morning before sunrise. I'm not so sure tomorrow is going to be the best day. I think we're going to have rain down here, but through the weekend and into next week, if you're up early in the morning around 4.30, you can set yourself up for sunrise coming about an hour later, but that will also position you for some really cool planet observing. Jupiter and Saturn look really, really great in the pre-dawn sky right now. So if you try to catch the moon in the pre-dawn sky, say Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday next week, maybe not Wednesday, but those other four days, you'll get a real treat because you'll see Saturn, Jupiter, and the moon, as the moon is uh, making its way around the Earth, headed toward the new moon phase, which comes when? On July 10th, on June 10th, a very special day, the reason why Jay is here to talk about. And uh, so you can do that in the morning as you're getting ready for what's happening then. So if we're actually thinking about it in the evening, though, for those of you that would rather do the evening observing rather than the late, uh, the early morning observing, Turns out over on the western side of the sky, just after sunset, Venus makes its appearance as the sky gets darker. Along with Venus, thank goodness, is the pinkish planet Mars, also there. So you'll find Venus really easily because it's bright and easy to spot. 
you'll recognize it immediately gleaming over on the western horizon. But above Venus, and just a little bit to the left, is dimmer Mars. Now, here's a way you can find it. As the sky darkens, there will be two bright stars above Venus. Those two bright stars are the two brightest stars in the constellation Gemini, the twins, Pollux and Castor. So what you'll see is when you see those two stars, look just to the left of those two stars and you'll see another glowing object. Not quite as bright, but no twinkle. You'll recognize that it's Mars by the pinkish color. And so that's how you can find Mars in the evening sky. Start with Venus, go up above Venus to the two stars, Pollux and Castor, and then just to the left of those two stars, you'll see Mars. Now, for those of you that received the telescope as a holiday gift, guess what? Here's your opportunity to get even more familiar, get some more practice time in with how that telescope works, because Venus is an easy target and Mars is an easy target. And since you're near those two bright stars in Gemini, they're great targets too. So you have an opportunity to catch two planets, the two closest planets to Earth, Venus on the sunward side, Mars on the outward side, and those two bright stars, Pollux and Castor and Gemini. You can do those, okay? So that's really cool. Now, uh, as I mentioned, pre-dawn sky, perfect time to get out and see Jupiter and Saturn, yes. If you happen to be down ashore, you know, you're going down the shore, you're down there, you want to uh, uh, spend some time at the shore. Well, if you're up early in the morning, uh, while you're down there, one of those mornings, 4.30 in the morning, you can catch Jupiter and Saturn as sunrise makes its way above or uh, over the ocean, looking out over the ocean. It's a great way to have a good, clear view of the eastern horizon. And so that way you'll be able to catch those planets uh, and the sunrise as it happens. It's a beautiful time of day to be up. Some constellations you might want to check for in the evening sky, and we'll uh, take a look at a star map a little bit later, but I'll just mention them pretty quickly. It's the spring circle uh, centered on Leo. There's Gemini, uh, Virgo, Uotes, and then up above in the north, Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. We'll do a little bit more about those when we come back and take a look at the sky. As far as space station is concerned, unfortunately, there's a space station pass tonight and a space station pass tomorrow night. Um, tonight, not such a good night here in the Delaware Valley, uh, but tomorrow night might be a little bit better. I think the weather is going to improve a little bit, but these passes aren't the best passes. And unfortunately, these are the last two evening passes for our region of the planet uh, for a couple of weeks. So if you don't catch them, don't worry. We'll have opportunity a couple of weeks from now to catch them in the evening sky again. But this is where they do that flip that we've talked about before where the viewing switches over to be in the pre-dawn sky for several weeks. So that's what's coming up next for space station viewing. And then a few weeks further after that, we'll be back in the evening sky again. We'll be well into summer by then, and you'll be all familiar with how to do all this by then anyway, right? Don't forget, send us your questions. We'd love to know. Uh, and so that's the major phenomenon for the sky of what's happening coming up this month, things you should get out and view. And we'll come back and we'll review those again as we go back and look at a star map. We'll look at a satellite map for how to find International Space Station. And we'll do some other house cleaning as we get around to that. Wonderful. Okay, great. So let me just stop right here and see if there are any questions. If you have any questions, I'm going to check with Linda here and see if she has anything. What do we have, Linda? Katie Ozek asked, <laughs> suggestions for tiny humans, <laughs> like little kids book for astronomy? Uh. And <laughs> Hi, Katie. It's Katie, our uh, our other technical uh, director, producer, who's usually with us. Hi, Katie. How's the little one doing? So glad you could be with us tonight. Katie is the person that usually does our producing for us, but she's been out on maternity leave. She just had another human brought into the world, another sky observer. That's really great, Katie. I'm glad, so glad to hear that and glad to hear from you. So Katie's question is, what can we do for young kids to look at the sky? And are there any books for young kids? Oh, yeah, there are plenty of books around. Uh, one of the best books that people know is Good Night Moon. There's a really wonderful one that you can uh, easily read to your kids without much difficulty and connects to the night sky. But, you know, the moon is a great target to start with, taking kids out to look at the night sky. Sure, they can see the stars and things like that. And Venus is an easy planetary target for them along with the moon. And I'd kind of recommend uh, Venus because it tends to be around in the sky for a long time. And of course, the moon 
once it makes its appearance in the sky, you can see it almost every evening for two to three weeks, depending how late you want to stay up. So that's a good target too. So uh, Katie, why don't you get the little beaners started on uh, Venus and then uh, when the moon comes back next weekend, not this weekend coming up, but the following weekend, it'll be a, a, a waxing crescent. You can uh, take them out and take a look at the sky then. Hey, thanks Katie, we'll see you again soon. Say hi to Nate for us, will you please? What else, Linda? Mike. He said, if I were on Jupiter, how long would it take for this transmission to continue? Oh, there's a really great question. What was the, who was it again? Mike. Oh, Mike. So Mike's question is, what's the, uh, what's the transit time, the uh, radio signal transit time, or the light time, if you will, from here to Jupiter? And gosh, oh, I'm going to have to scratch my head on that one and say maybe it's, uh, maybe it's a couple of hours from here out to there, you know. It's a really long way out. It's somewhere around 14 minutes or so, 14 to 23 minutes, I think. Well, no, I think it's five. Off. I think it's five astronomical units to Jupiter. Five astronomical. Uh, okay, so we can do five right. times eight. So if we're on its side, then it's four astronomical units from us, and mm -hmm. it takes eight minutes to the sun. So it should take mm -hmm. about half an hour. Uh, if uh, Jupiter is uh, at opposition, uh, half an hour. And wow, uh, it was on the other side another 15 minutes. There you go, Mike. How about that? There you go. A calculated answer right in front of your eyes. Thanks a lot, Jay. Greatly appreciate that. <laughs> and you know what? That's a great segue. So let's now uh, bring into our conversation uh, our guest for this evening. Our guest this evening, Dr. Jay Pasikoff, is the Field Memorial Professor of Astronomy and the Director of the Hopkins Observatory at Williams College in Williamstown, Massachusetts. And he's a visiting scientist at Carnegie Observatory. He's currently the chair of the International Astronomical Union's Working Group on Solar Eclipses and a member of the American Astronomical Society's Solar Eclipse Task Force. His current eclipse research is supported by the Solar Terrestrial Program of the Atmospheric and Geospace Sciences Division of the U.S. National Science Foundation. His Pluto Arakoff research has been supported by NASA. He also studies the atmosphere of Pluto through observation of stellar occultation. So if you were wondering about the atmosphere of Pluto, here's your chance to learn a little bit more about that. Jay has a ton, a ton of awards, both national and international, from everywhere you can imagine. But Jay has this really interesting distinction. Jay has spent more time in the moon's shadow than anyone else ever. Now, I'm sure that sounds really intriguing and you might be having a difficult time figuring out what that means, but Jay's gonna tell us all about it. So I just wanna say greetings, Jay, and thanks so much for joining us tonight. Well, thank you very much, Derek, for, uh, for inviting me. Um, and uh, I, it's been my pleasure to see you uh, from time to time over the years. And in fact, I have something in my slides, so if, if I can show some slides, am I co-host? Does your producer have me as, as co-host? Can I share my screen? If he doesn't have, if he doesn't have you as co-host yet. Think, I, I think he's ahead. I think he already, he already has that. I think you've got it, Jay, go ahead. Let's, uh, well, let me, let me see. Um, I'm going to stop that chair and try and try again. Okay. Um, so you have a really great eclipse picture behind you already. Uh, yes, that's from uh, the last American eclipse in 2017, where we were, and I'll talk about that. Uh, mm -hmm. And here's what I wanted to to share. Um, Excellent. And let's go. Um, so in particular, I'm going to talk about next week's eclipse a little bit, which is after all why you invited me, uh, I think. And as you see, that's an eclipse that starts right over the Canadian border and goes a little bit of Greenland and goes right over the North Pole and winds up in Siberia. Uh, and and I'll, I'll talk about that. But uh, as you know, Americans are not allowed to drive over the border to Canada at the moment, but Sky and Telescope Magazine has organized a flight out of Minneapolis. So my wife and I are flying to Minneapolis in a couple of days 
and Thursday morning, uh, and you've already shown how early sunrise is. So we have to gather at two in the morning and take off at three in the morning um, to uh, fly into Canada without landing and see the eclipse from at the sunrise, just a couple of degrees uh, above the horizon on Thursday. Right, so, you're, so you're not gonna land, you're not gonna land someplace, you're actually gonna observe while you're flying. Well, I think we don't have permission to land in Canada, so I think we have okay. to. Um, okay. And then there's another annular eclipse, and I've seen uh, about 20 annual eclipses. I don't know the exact count, but there's another one that's coming across in October 2023. And mm -hmm. as you can see uh, over here where, where you are, it'll be 40% or so um, covered. Uh, it'll look like that. So whenever uh, you do have a partial eclipse, and I'm going to say, and you have an, uh, and you will have a partial eclipse like this this coming Thursday, if you can see low in the horizon at sunrise uh, near you, um, you do need an eye protection filter there. Uh, I don't know if you have some at the museum, at the Franklin Institute. Uh, Here we are, Jay. So can people come and pick them up? No, they can't, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> what we did though, Jay, was for the 2017 eclipse, we distributed thousands of these around the city and yeah. we implored people to hold on to them to use for the next solar eclipse. So hopefully they did, we'll find out. So I hope they have them. I could, I could send you a few more, a hundred more. Uh, but anyway, those are the, the next two annular uh, eclipses of which you can see the partial phases uh, from, right, from right where you are. Uh, mm -hmm. And then um, there's going to be a total solar eclipse in 2024 that goes from Mexico through Texas and and up through Niagara Falls, and and uh, and I'll say something more about that in a, in a little bit. I have a map to show you too, and you're going to have a pretty, pretty uh, small crescent, uh, an, an almost total, but not quite in uh, in Philadelphia, or as you okay. can the, the Delaware Valley. <laughs> but since we're talking about annular eclipses, I thought I'd talk about one that I took my students to see out at the very large array. This big array of radio telescopes in New Mexico in, uh, in 2012. And, uh, uh, and, and you talked about some events for the sun in the middle of July. I'm guessing that's when the earth is furthest from the sun. Is that what's gonna go you on? You said it, yes, exactly. Well, when the earth is furthest from the sun and the sun's a little smaller than average, so it's already a little smaller than average. And um, well, uh, so in any case, uh, it depends what the moon's el elliptical orbit is. And when the moon is, is smaller than average, then it doesn't quite cover the sun. Uh, and that's what we have for an annular eclipse here. We had one of those uh, in 2012 and you can see the, the moon fit inside. So we had this uh, disc, this uh, ring. So these are called mm -hmm. ring eclipses or annular eclipses. Uh, unfortunately, you might see in the paper, somebody who called it a ring of fire but there's no fire. This is not fire. This is just the the yeah. sun shining. So it's really a ring of sunlight or a ring of brightness uh, eclipse. And that's what what I hope to see at the window of the plane on on Thursday. So I did have a class of uh, studying solar astronomy out among the antennas of the very large array in New Mexico for that annular eclipse in this super wide angle view here. Oh, that's a great picture. Sure. Yeah. During annularity. Uh, there, uh, and and uh, and then the then the moon moves off, and we get this crescent, um, which is uh, what you'll see from the Delaware Valley on uh, on Thursday morning. So, either stay up all night and you'll be up late, or get up pretty early to uh, to see that. And we just had uh, the sun setting after the eclipse there, and there wasn't an, an annular eclipse. Um, well, f almost four years ago in uh, southern Argentina, and one of my students, Mujo Lu, put together this composite of the images I took. And again, uh, over an hour or so, the moon covers more and more of the sun, and then it just fits inside uh, here uh, because it's uh, the moon is is uh, smaller than average, even even if the sun is uh, a little smaller than average. And too. it's uh, it's beautifully symmetrical. Uh, yes, yes. So mm -hmm. we we got to the center 
uh, path for uh, for that. Uh, right. But I thought I'd talk for a little bit around a total eclipse, which is how I got in the eclipse business. When I was a freshman at Harvard, there was an eclipse that started off the coast of Massachusetts. And our professor, Donald Menzel, uh, took the class of a dozen of us, minus the one girl who overslept, um, to, into the path of totality. Um, and uh, that was my first eclipse. Uh, and now I've seen 35 of these total eclipses, and this was the one that went over the United States in 2017. Yes. And so uh, uh, obviously uh, Derek made a big thing of it in Philadelphia, I'm sure, and all over the country um, th there was. Uh, so uh, where, where I was in Oregon, we had this beautiful total eclipse. So these parts need, a, need that special filter uh, and then no filter at all to see the solar corona uh, because it's about the same brightness as the moon. So only in this phase, when we have a total eclipse, is it uh, just as safe to look at as, uh, as it is to look at the, at the full moon. Uh, but whenever any part of the sun uh, comes out from behind the moon, and, and here it's just coming out or, or going in, and it's what we call the diamond ring effect on the edge uh, here. Um, and, and I guess it was the last bit of everyday sunlight so you take your filters away and you see the solar corona and you can see these reddish things which are hydrogen gas on the edge of the sun called, uh, called prominences. And uh, in 1918, the US Naval Observatory invited a, a Princeton graduate in, in physics who was also an artist to join their, uh, their uh, expedition to, uh, uh, to Oregon. And, and he got so interested that he painted uh, not only 1918, but went back in 1923 and 1925 uh, to, uh, to paint eclipses. And, and this is the full size that's, that, that was in New York um, at the Hayden Planetarium in New York. Uh, mm -hmm. But you can see that in 1918, the path went from Goldendale, Washington, all across the country uh, to Florida, and then in 23, it, it hit Lombok, just a little bit of Lombok, California, and in 25, it hit Connecticut, and 32, it hit the coast of, of Maine, and you can see the path in 2017 was kind of similar to what we had 99 years uh, before. Uh, mm -hmm. So he had these beautiful uh, paintings, but uh, unfortunately, they're in storage now. They knocked down that old Art Deco building in New York and put up uh, a, a modern glass thing without these uh, these paintings, uh, and in fact they had some uh, some covering uh, up before they knocked that building down. At one point they put an electrical conduit through uh, wow. the wall and we got this central uh, this central painting. And these were wow. so uh, so they said uh, that my wife and I could uh, could see the originals if we promised not to tell anybody where they were in storage, <laughs> secret storage from the American Museum of Natural History. Well, These are you know, I, I, I know a place where you can see some similar paintings. Well, and, 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 uh, and so do I. Well, anyway, so he got, then there was one more that's not in that uh, triptych from, he saw from Maine from his studio. Uh, but then in, in 2009, I had the pleasure of uh, being invited by Dr. Pitts here to the Franklin Institute. Maybe I invited myself. <laughs> but we had, wonderful, we had a wonderful time at the, at the Franklin Institute uh, here. And what did I find at the end of the corridor, but uh, half-sized versions of these paintings uh, by Howard Russell uh, Butler. And uh, so right over, the, uh, right over the thesis. So I thought that was, I thought that was wonderful. And, uh, and I was very glad to see them. So here's 1918 and uh, uh, and uh, the 1923 in the middle with the diamond ring effect, and uh, uh, and then 19 uh, and then 1925 uh, there. So you were very fortunate to have that. And the reason that my wife and I came, and I was at Caltech at the time, so we actually flew across the country uh, to see the wonderful exhibit uh, of the uh, of uh, Galileo's material, especially and other material from that time. 
because it was the 400th anniversary of 1609 when Galileo first turned his telescope on the on the heavens, this this little telescope, um, and uh, it and I've also been looking into uh, 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 Simon Marius, uh, who it turns out uh, when uh, he wrote down what he saw on the moons of Jupiter one day after Galileo did, and none of you have heard of Marius, and uh, Galileo beat him out by one day. Uh, mm. But anyway, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> talk I, about I, being I, in the right place at the right time. That's right, but I, so I had been at the museum, here's my wife uh, near a display of one of Galileo's telescopes that you guys had there at the Franklin Institute. And I had not been allowed to photograph, nobody was allowed to photograph the telescopes in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in Florence in Italy, but they'd closed those and sent these around the world. And fortunately I knew the right guy in Dr. Pitts and he let me photograph the uh, the uh, telescope, which I was very interested to uh, uh, to do, uh, we were we were so fortunate in that Jay because uh, the the museum where they had been housed had been closed for renovation at that time, and uh, we were fortunate enough to have just the right connections to allow us to bring it to Philadelphia, and it was the first time the telescope had ever left Florence. And on its way back to Florence, it made another stop on the way. And once it returned to Florence, it's not expected it's gonna leave ever again. So we were truly, truly fortunate to have that there along with that fabulous collection of our Renaissance uh, scientific instruments. And so yes, they all fit together all, really nicely. Yeah, there were all these brass instruments that were there too from the- Yeah, they were beautiful. The it, was just, it was just great. And also there were some copies of uh, his the book from 1609 in which he announced these planets. This is actually my own copy of it, but, uh, but you had some Ooh. of the Galileo's books on display. Uh, and then he used that telescope to see more stars in uh, the Orion Nebula. He couldn't see nebulosity. Uh, and then he discovered these little things going around Jupiter and he didn't know what they were right away, uh, but uh, he finally uh, figured out that these were moons because they changed from day to day. And then he had these uh, drawings of this. This is from the National Library. These are wash uh, drawings of the moon. And he discovered the craters and, and, uh, and uh, Mare, uh, Maria on the, uh, on the moon. Um, so that was just wonderful. So thanks again, uh, Derek. I was really glad. To, to sure, that. sure. So glad you could come see it. So anyway, I've continued my work on eclipses and we had a big observation with a lot of my students from Williams College uh, on the campus of Willamette University in Salem, Oregon for, uh, uh, for the eclipse. Then a bunch of our undergraduates and some of our graduate students and other uh, alumni who came at that time and some scientific colleagues. So, we did, so we've been studying the solar uh, corona. Here are the alumni uh, and uh, undergraduates uh, here. Um, and of course, the solar eclipse is when the moon is blocking the sun and this point of the shadow just about reaches the earth. And when there's a total eclipse, it hits the earth and is a, a maybe 100 miles or 200 miles across. But what's gonna happen this coming Thursday, it's gonna fall a little short. And this is called the umbra, the shadow. And we're gonna have the ant umbra when it comes out the other side, if you extend these lines a little bit and uh, for an annular eclipse. And then uh, last week we had a lunar eclipse because the moon was halfway around and it fit in the Earth's shadow and the Earth's shadow is bigger than the moon's shadow. So there's more leeway for the moon to fit in. And it was really not, really near the edge, kind of marginal. And it was also very low in the horizon. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very cool phenomenon that these, uh, that these two things go together. When you have one, you'll have another within two weeks. Well, my, my sister-in-law uh, wrote my wife uh, this morning and said she was confused. Didn't we already have a have an eclipse? Why was there another eclipse next week? So we we explained that these uh, solar and lunar eclipses are different and that they come two weeks apart. So anyway, uh, it just happens that the moon, even though it's 400 times closer than the sun, is also 400 times smaller. So it just so uh, instead of the Empire State Building at 40 kilometers or an apple held uh, at the other side of a room. It all takes up this half a degree 
which is uh, the, the size of the moon or the sun uh, in the sky. And so I'm particularly interested in studying the outer atmosphere of the sun, which is called the corona, which is Latin from crown. And we see these beautiful shapes that are held in place by the magnetic field of the, uh, of the sun. Um, and, uh, and we just had beautiful weather across a lot of the country in, uh, in 2017. And again, these are partial phases through uh, filter uh, and then no filter for the, uh, for the totality. So we really uh, uh, lucked out a lot across the country. Now there are spacecraft now and people ask me a lot, why do we still studying the sun from the ground? But it turns out that this is the best spacecraft view of the corona, which is pretty spectacular. It goes way, way out, but the inner corona is so bright they have to block out this whole inner region. And that's just where we take our eclipse photos. So this is a composite with a filter diagram in, in uh, near x-rays or extreme ultraviolet of what's on the surface of the sun. Uh, and and that was that we've just pasted that over the black uh, moon mm -hmm. that would otherwise be here in the photograph. And then these are our images that we've worked to put uh, together um, because it's a thousand times brighter here than here. So you need a few different frames to put together to get, and then you can see the extensions out in space from this uh, spacecraft, which was built by the Naval Research Laboratory and controlled by NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center on a satellite from the European Space Agency. So there's a lot of international collaboration. Yeah, those are, those are fantastic yeah. images. Uh, thank you. Uh, but you can see that th there's a real shadow of the moon falling on the Earth. And NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, has its satellites uh, that are looking down on the Earth. And this was a newish one at the time, goes 16. But even though its cameras are looking down at the Earth, it's got solar panels that are facing the sun. So now, starting with this series of GOES-16, there's a solar telescope with six filters in the extreme ultraviolet looking at the sun uh, all the time. And we've been working with those. Uh, with those That's clever. It's a good uh, yes. thing to do, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. If it's going to be there, why not have a look? Uh, yes. So, uh, so we have those wonderful images there. So, but here, as you see, this really had a shadow that went across uh, the United States. But if you were on the moon, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter uh, just could look down and photograph the shadow of the moon on the, uh, on the Earth. So maybe, sure. maybe we'll get to, to go to the moon. And we have a local astronaut uh, from near, near me, from uh, Pittsfield, Mass, Stephanie Wilson. Um, and yeah. she, she's, she's been up uh, three times on space shuttle. She invited my wife and me to join her family group for that. So she's one of the 18 astronauts, including nine women, who are being considered to be the first uh, people on, uh, on the moon um, uh, in, uh, to land on the moon uh, since the end of the Apollo missions. So we're, we're rooting for Stephanie Wilson. Oh, that's great. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. If you were in, and from the space station, they looked down and they could see the shadow again of, uh, of the uh, eclipse. Uh, and, uh, and there was a, a group of, uh, from Space Grant who sent, sent up uh, a, a student group, uh, who sent up cameras. And, and so it's a real shadow of the, uh, of the eclipse and it's just fantastic to see. So I hope all the people who are listening will go out of their way in 2024 to go in the path of, uh, of totality. And, and I'll tell you a little later uh, what other opportunities there will be. But my student, um, uh, Christian Lockwood put together this composite again, showing the structure of the magnetic field. Uh, so it's kind of like uh, iron filings on a bar magnet here. You can see coming out of the poles uh, here. Uh, and then just these longer exposures uh, show the magnetic field holding the, the hot gas, million degree gas going further and further out. Um, but this umber is not really round because the Moon's shape isn't really round. And now NASA and the Japanese Space Agency have mapped the details. And, and so we can actually know what the actual shape is. And we can uh, simulate the eclipse much better than we used to be able to do um, and tell what, when those beads of light will be on the edge of the sun. 
And we did in uh, 2017 have some sunspots on the sun, nothing right at the edge that we would see in the corona, but there were some, some regions of strong magnetic activity that's mapped here again from, from a NASA spacecraft here. And so the regions of sunspots are surrounded by more magnetic field and the sunspots are just places where the magnetic field is a couple of thousand times stronger than in a typical bar magnet. And I'm working with these people of Predictive Science Incorporated from San Diego, and they use the measurements of the magnetic field and the sunspots in advance, and they make a prediction a few days, this was three days before the eclipse, of what the eclipse is going to look like. And, uh, and then we observe, uh, and then we can compare these, and we can use these to uh, improve the predictions and take things into advance. And uh, uh, well, uh, and that's and, not bad for a prediction. Yes, so we've done this at the eclipses uh, since then too, and we have an uh, arrangement to do that right before the next eclipse. And and at this last eclipse in in December, within 24 hours, we were able to get our, um, our composite put together at this time by Wendy Carlos in New York, and get it into a NASA press release within 24 hours, uh, comparing their predictions, which of course were already available with uh, yeah. with our, uh, our our observations. So uh, anyway, here's a series showing these Bailey speeds of the last sunlight coming through the edge of the uh, moon. And then we were working with a colleague at MIT, uh, looking to see whether there are oscillations in the magnetic field of the sun that it's heating the magnetic field into millions of degrees. And we look especially at gas that's a million degree hot. Uh, and these are iron lines. And the iron, which normally has 26 electrons, has been stripped over here by half of them. And it has to be over a million degrees to do that here. And so we were looking for uh, detailed studies uh, in, in that as a way of heating the corona with, with uh, waves going back and forth in magnetic loops on the edge of the sun. And uh, we just looked at this little patch on the edge of the sun. And in the meantime, I told you about the solar telescope on the solar panels of GOES-16. Well, mm -hmm. this is a picture taken uh, of the sun through, uh, through one of those filters. That's uh, amazing. The imaging, the imaging capability has come so far in the last couple of decades, Jay. This yes. is really stunning imagery. Yep, so it's just spectacular. And this is called the coronal hole you see near the poles. Mm, yeah. There's mm -hmm. a little cooler and a little less corona uh, right. there that we were observing here. And, and then, so here's our composite with uh, the uh, spacecraft mm -hmm. view here from the GOES-16, and then our eclipse here, and then the, uh, this uh, coronagraph view, as it's, uh, as it's called. Uh, really nice. Um, and just to compare, going back 20 years, in 1999, this was solar maximum. And you mm -hmm. can see the streamers coming out in all directions, whereas at solar minimum, uh, which is close to what we had in 2017, you can see, mm -hmm. I'm gonna show you the sunspot cycle in a minute, but you can see there are just a few streamers uh, near the equator, and then you have these plumes near the, uh, near the pole. So there's quite a contrast. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So we've been following the shape of the corona over uh, over time, and you can see when when it's solar maximum, then the corona is very round, and when it's yes. near solar minimum, then the sun is more elliptical. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there are these uh, coronal mass ejections that come out that this uh, same device on the spacecraft uh, looks at, and this one is coming all around, so it's more or less coming towards us. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that the government puts a lot of money into studying the sun, because if, if this were to zap some of the spacecraft, uh, you, these billion dollar spacecraft could all be uh, killed. And, uh, but, but even with a few minutes notice, you can turn off the high voltage and, and do take other, mm -hmm. uh, other precautions. So this is a uh, sure. mass ejection. Um, most yeah. of the time they're going off to the side and they're not gonna hit us on earth. So anyway, we had a wonderful time in uh, 2017. Again, the filter here and then no filter diamond ring and the inner corona, longer exposures uh, for the outer corona. 
and these beautiful prominences on the edge of the uh, uh, of the sun. And so here's you can see the rotation of the sun uh, here from eclipse day to the following day. So something had come around the edge a little bit here in these uh, in these uh, sunspot groups as the sun uh, as the sun rotated. And uh, as of uh, uh, this month uh, here, just a couple of days ago, um, uh, you can see how the sunspots numbers go up and down. Um, and you can see the last sunspot cycle was half the one before and the third, the one before that. And so there's a lot of predictions as to what's gonna happen next. Is it gonna be another low one or another high one? And I was actually quoted in the New York Times a couple of days ago, reporting on a meeting I went to uh, a few years ago, in which one, one paper in the afternoon session was that the next cycle will be lower than average. And the second paper was that the next cycle will be higher than average. And the third <laughs> paper was that it'll be either lower than average or higher than average. <laughs> and the fourth paper would be, it would be neither lower than average or higher than average. <laughs> And so I'm quoted saying, I'm just going to wait and see. <laughs> Good but choice. Here's, but here's the current cycle where the yellow is the daily stuff, and then mm -hmm. it just averages out. And uh, and so this eclipse that I showed you was lowering, getting low there, was far from, from the peak. And now we're over here, and it's beginning to go up uh, again, but just where it's going to go and reach a peak. Right in three or four years uh, that, that we don't know. We'll have, to, we'll have to wait and see. In the meantime, we're studying the, the spectrum. Uh, we break the light down and let the crescent at the edge of the sun make its own uh, narrow band. And this iron 14 is iron that's lost 13 electrons. And so this green line comes from uh, gas that's about a million and a half degrees. And there's a fainter red one that's a million degrees, and depending on the temperature of the corona, as that varies over the cycle, the ratio of them varies. And we've been been uh, studying that, and we've been making these uh, these observations. This is together with my Greek colleague Aris Bulgaris. Here we've been uh, been working with, and my student Tim Nagel McNorton has been working on the computer uh, work on that. And, and you can see if you subtract there. Uh, there are uh, the different temperatures are in different places sure. around the sun. Um, oh, beautiful and, work. Uh, yeah, and then at an eclipse in 1868, this yellow stuff turned out that was pretty bright. And it turns out it's not exactly where those yellow lines from sodium are that you know that if you throw salt into a flame. And, and so they said at the time, it must come from helium because that exists only on the sun because helium was mm. the sun god and that was the mm -hmm. discovery of helium so the helium was discovered on the sun before it was found on uh, on earth so here's this yeah. one from iron 13 times ionized iron here and the red line shows a little better there so we've been talking about how to make those observations at the next at the next eclipses and and so we have these images and we orient them and we we work we're working on that Anyway, uh, we do have predictions of where the eclipses are going to go. The first person to really draw it out on a map of the Earth was Edmund Halley in 1715. And then he asked people to observe whether they saw the eclipse or not. And, and, and then they adjusted the path uh, by a few miles uh, and a few minutes of time and made another prediction for the following eclipse that went the other way and went from there down to uh, France. Uh, but but now uh, we have the uh, detailed mapping of the moon, and these are predictions on the right from my friend Xavier Jubier, and these are our observations, and uh, and it's very sensitive. So now we know the actual size of the moon from the spacecraft. So in fact, we're improving the measurements of the size of the sun, because that's the sun that's uh, sticking out. Uh, and that was one of the questions I had for you, uh, you know, about why we still study eclipses. Well, so that's one of the things we're working on, and mm -hmm. and here are values uh, that we compared uh, here, and we gave a paper at the uh, American Astronomical Society meeting on that, and we'll hope to make these reserv these uh, measurements at all the future eclipses. And okay. so I like these uh, XKCD uh, <laughs> comics here. 
how cool sure. it sounds like it would be. Yep. See, the lunar eclipse uh, sounds like it might be cool. Partial solar eclipse mm -hmm. sounds like it might be cool. And this is how cool it is in person. As you can see, the total solar eclipse is off the chart there compared yes. with a yes. lunar eclipse or a partial. And, and, I, and I appreciate it that the supermoon is positioned according. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then I'm working with a Venezuelan atmospheric physicist, especially, um, and uh, we make temperature measurements and wind and pressure, and you can see that there are effects right in the middle of totality when it gets a million times darker very uh, abruptly. So we've been studying that. And Michael Roman is a, another colleague. Rossi was my senior thesis uh, student who made this, this graph. Um, Great. And then uh, I'm finishing up on the sequence of photos now, but uh, NASA has a couple of spacecraft that are partway around the sun. So we get a view of the backside a little bit. And one of them is still working, this, this stereo ahead, and we can mm -hmm. get a 3D view. And that's why it's called stereo, although it stands for, uh, for uh, a, an acronym here. And then, uh, and then this, uh, uh, this uh, spacecraft, uh, the, the cameras on the solar panels uh, can just get these great views all the, all the time now, and it's a newish spacecraft, so we hope that'll be up a couple of decades. Well, anyway, uh, moving, moving ahead then, uh, there was another eclipse in 2019 over Chile, uh, and I was right in the center line here, and I had some colleagues on the Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory, and I'm not going to say much about that just because of time, but, but it was beautifully clear at uh, great altitude. There was a double sure. diamond ring at the beginning and diamond rings in the corona in the middle. Aris Vulgaris made these images from Cerro Tololo. Uh, and uh, you can really see the shadow of the moon uh, here and the eclipse right in the middle of the shadow of the moon. And then off to the sides, you're seeing 100 miles away where where there is not to total eclipse, and you're seeing this sunset effect, this reddishness that um, uh, that David Slinsky took this uh, this picture, and and you can see that all the way uh, around on the horizon. And then last December there was an eclipse that went over southern Chile and Argentina, and I planned to go, and we had a group going here on the coast, and then the COVID came, and so the, all the groups mm -hmm. were. Uh, disbanded and and uh, I was finally not allowed to go myself, uh, but I did arrange special permission for for some uh, astronomers to go in to uh, to uh, here to Pucon over here where it turned out to be cloudy. There was a clear spot uh, in uh, uh, in here, and so I was working with people to to get observations there, and I worked them with NASA to put out a press release on with those other people's observations. So anyway, looking ahead, uh, especially for eclipses in the United States, here was 2017. Um, and, then, and then in 2024 here, this next total okay. eclipse is, as you see, it, it, it misses Philadelphia, but not by all that much uh, here. And then 2023, there'll be this annular eclipse and won't be uh, quite as uh, much covered in uh, in uh, Philadelphia, and mm -hmm. uh, and then in uh, 2044 you can go up to Montana, or 2045 you can go to Florida to see uh, to see an eclipse. So anyway, uh, here's where I'm going to be on Thursday. I hope uh, in an airplane that takes off from here and uh, and hits the beginning of the eclipse uh, uh, here to see that partial eclipse, and where you are uh, uh, here. Uh, somewhere in there. You're going to be right, right in there. Yeah. Yeah. That's you. That's what you're going to see. Washington will be a little bit higher up, right? But it's, but it's low in the horizon, so you got to be up early in the morning, and uh, yeah. and see it. It'll there. be a real challenge. And if you go to my website at eclipses.info, which is the easiest possible web address to remember, just eclipses.info, you can Thank link. You. That's good. You can link to the eclipse and click wherever you like. And you can see that at sunrise, the sun is at zero degrees, uh, but it'll be 72% covered. Um, and then uh, the maximum is, is just about then, uh, but 
but it's only 11 degrees. Uh, okay. Oh, then, well, then the maximum uh, will be 11 degrees. Oh, I see. I see. I'm sorry. That's the angle uh, on the horizon. And the partial eclipse ends at nine degrees above the horizon. So you got to have a pretty clear horizon, uh, which I don't have in Williamstown, but we're not going to watch from Williamstown. We need, a, we, need a clear, we need a clear horizon, clear weather, and we yeah. have about an hour in which we can actually view any, yes. of, the, uh, any of the eclipse. So in an hour, it's going to go down from 72% coverage to 0%. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. So I hope you get a view. And then the plan for me is to fly uh, with the Sky and Telescope flight that's arranged by Kelly Beatty out of Minneapolis Airport over to Canada and, mm -hmm. and the fly on this path right near the beginning of the uh, eclipse for a, a few minutes. And I hope to, I've been putting my cameras together, uh, some Nikons, and, and Nikon just lent me a couple of cameras too, the latest cameras. Uh, mm -hmm although they changed chip size, so I have to get some new chips that I hope will arrive overnight tomorrow. Um, wow. And uh, uh, anyway, I have time to, before next Thursday to, to practice some more, and I have my older cameras, but uh, hope to photograph the uh, annular phase out the window uh, there on, uh, on Thursday morning. And then Sounds as exciting. I told, hmm? Sounds exciting. I hope so. And then uh, 2023, we'll have this annular eclipse across the uh, United States from Texas on to crossing the paths in Texas uh, up to Oregon and Washington. And, um, uh, and then uh, you can see where you're in here somewhere. Uh, mm -hmm. So you're right. at, uh, 25, 27% cover here. So that's not as much. But, uh, but you'll be able to see some partial eclipse then in 2023. And then 2024, um, we'll go, I'm, I'm intending to be in Mazatlan in Mexico because the weather statistics are better there, but it's mm -hmm. gonna go up through, uh, the through the Northeast there and goes through the upper Vermont and New, and, uh, and New Hampshire uh, uh, here. Um, yeah. That'll be another opportunity for many millions of people to yes. experience an eclipse. Yes, yeah. and mm -hmm. and uh, and so I, so in Williamstown, where I certainly are, are not planning to be on that occasion, but nonetheless, the sun will be ninety six percent covered. Uh, but even one percent of the sun, you see, the sun is a million times brighter than the corona. So even if one percent of the sun is uh, left. That still makes it 10,000 times brighter than the corona. So you really have to be in totality and not in any of the partial phases. And then, especially the younger people in your audience here, uh, in, uh, can look forward to April 12th, 2045, and they should go down to Florida or Alabama to see the eclipse at that time. You can, you can go to Disney World at the same, or Universal at the same time, or um, and what a great coincidence. See a total eclipse on April 12th, 2045. And then my favorite is 2079 uh, here, uh, where, yeah. where totality actually begins um, uh, at the edge of the United States. And, uh, and New York and Boston are actually in, uh, actually in totality right at, uh, uh, at sunrise. Um, I'm going to try to make that one, but I don't know how that'll work out. Yeah, so May 1st, 2079. So me too. I'm looking forward to trying, uh, to trying that one. And, uh, uh, and Philadelphia is right on the edge. Right uh, on the very edge. Yeah. Right on the very edge in May 1st, 20. This, is, uh, this has been great, Jay. This has been fabulous. Well, Thank so you very much you. for showing us all that. Yeah, well, I gave you some things to look forward to now. Yeah, absolutely. And you gave us a good introduction for what we can be looking for. Let me just ask you uh, just, a, just a quick question, if I can, before I let you go. Um, so uh, you've seen about, is it 72 eclipses you've seen in total? That's correct. And, uh, that, and what's that? That, that includes uh, 35 totals. And I forget the, the other numbers, but 17 or 18 annulars and the rest partials. 
That's a lot. That's a lot. And what's the, what's the magic numbers, Jay, for the amount of time you spent in the moon's shadow? I don't actually know that. Uh, there is a, a fellow named Bill Kramer who has a website called eclipse-chasers.com, and he's got lists of those. Um, ah, okay. But, uh, okay. But, now, if, if you can just hold on, we have a question for you, Jay. Go ahead, Linda. Sure. Amy would like to know, where would you recommend she go to see the 2023 eclipse? And she still has her 2017 Franklin Institute eclipse glasses. That's cool. Amy, uh, Amy still has her 2017 eclipse glasses, Jay. And she's wondering, cool. what would you recommend? Uh, where would you recommend she go to for the 2023 eclipse? Um, well, uh, I actually look at the website of Jay Anderson, the meteorologist I mentioned, and his, his cloudiness statistics website is Eclipsophile, but no E on Eclipse, E-C-L-I-P-S-O-P-H-I-L-E.com. Got it, Eclipsophile.com. And he's got a map for 2023. So I've been looking okay. mainly at the map for 2024, and I see that Texas is clearer than New England, but Mazatlan in the middle of Mexico is clearer than Texas. So I'm planning to go to Mexico in 2024. For 2023, I, I just haven't paid attention. So I'm gonna leave your auditor to uh, uh, to look up Jay Anderson's site at Eclipsophile. We will post that in the comments, eclipsophile.com. Jay, if you can unshare your screen, please. Yep. Super, that's great. Okay, wonderful. So Jay, I want to say thank you very much for joining us today. It's been really wonderful to have you uh, provide all this information and share with us a lot of the research that you've done. And uh, also, you've given us some great information for what we can look forward to coming up, uh, both uh, this next week, uh, next year, and the year after that, 2024, as well as going out as far as 2079. So for our very youngest viewers, uh, they'll have some information they can carry with them for a little while as they uh, as they plan to see that eclipse sometime from now. So Jay, have a really great time next Thursday. Good luck with everything. Uh, I hope it all works out for you. And uh, we look forward to seeing some of your images uh, from then. And uh, I'll say thanks again, Jay. Uh, thanks a lot for being with us. And uh, you know we'll let you go now, but again, wish you good luck next week. And so, well, thank, uh, and thank you. It was great having you, Jay. And, and thank you very much. And let me know what uh, you and your and your listeners there get from the Philadelphia area. Yeah, we certainly will do that. And uh, come see us again, Jay. Come down and visit okay. us in Philly again. Yeah, that'll there. be fun. Good. I will. Okay, great. All Thanks. right. Take care. Bye. See ya. Okay, so. We had a great tour of the eclipse scene for the next several years, folks. We have a little bit of housekeeping work we're going to do here before we're done for the evening. Uh, but let's just see if we can get right to that. Don't forget, we're still after your questions. We'll get a couple of those, too. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen uh, just so I can go over to the night sky and give us a chance to take a look at what's available to see out there under the evening sky. And I'm going to use my favorite... Uh, my favorite sky viewing tool uh, for these programs, and that is Stellarium Web. You can see I have Stellarium Web up here now. And uh, as you're looking at this, you'll see I have it set looking out toward the south southeastern portion of the sky. You'll see where my cursor is here. I'm going to drag the sky around a little bit so that we're looking directly out to the south. If we go down into the lower right hand corner here, you'll see my time and date register here tells me that I'm observing at 2350. So that's 10 minutes of midnight. I'm gonna back us up a little bit so we can start almost right after sunset. So here we are right at nine o'clock in the evening. I'm gonna run us forward a little bit just to darken the sky. And I'm gonna bring us around to the west so that we can see that Venus is available after sunset at about 9 p.m. And if you look closely, you can see that Mars is, as I said, above Venus and just a little bit to the left. And you'll also see these two bright stars here that are Castor and Pollux. These, these are the stars that are at the, uh, at the top of the twins of Gemini that are uh, visible in the sky at this time of this year. They're the twins right there. Uh, Pollux and Castor are standing next to each other. So if we take these two stars and just come over to the left, we'll see where, where Mars is. Venus is uh, down here below the artwork tree, if you will. So. Uh, <laughs> If you make sure you don't have a tree in the way blocking your view of Venus as you're looking at that in the evening sky. 
So that's right around 9 p.m. in the evening. I'm going to back us out a little bit more here so we can see more of the sky. I'm going to bring us around to the eastern side of the sky now. Again, it's 9 p.m. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to advance time over here in the southeast uh, so we can uh, just step ourselves forward in time. Let's see. There we go. And we're going to go, uh, just, going to, just going to take that forward. We're at 10 o'clock now, 11 o'clock. Here's midnight. And if you'll notice, right down on the eastern horizon here, you can see the word Saturn coming up, and then there's Saturn right behind it. So this is 1 a.m. Saturn and Jupiter have now crossed the eastern horizon, so you can see them. And we're going to go right up to just before sunrise, and you'll see how they're rising higher and higher in the sky. Sunrise is coming for us at 4.09 in the morning. I'm going to advance the time slowly. You'll see where the moon is here, not far from Jupiter and Saturn. I'll take us out just a bit more so we can see more of the horizon. And here we are now at 4.35 in the morning. And as we come around to sunrise, which I said was at 5.32 in the morning, we're now a half an hour before sunrise. And just look at this beautiful view. This is a really great view. And you can see here now Jupiter and Saturn in the pre-dawn sky with that waning crescent moon, that very, very thin banana-shaped moon or fingernail moon, if you will, that's right over there as the sky is brightening and we're getting around to sunrise. So you can see what those objects are like uh, for observing. Uh, so we came right across the sky, folks. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna bring us back to that late evening sky, if you will. So I'm gonna back time up here and I'm gonna come right around to right around 10 p.m. And uh, you can see, I, I, have some, I have some satellites stretched across my sky here. Uh, and of course, I can click on these and find out what they are. They're part of the star link system. And uh, these are uh, satellites that will be sliding across the sky as you're out observing, as you're looking. And you'll be able to see the string of dots as they go by. But I just wanted to show you the constellations that are available right now. Here's the artwork of those constellations that's available around on the eastern side. And I'm going to bring us around to the south just so we can be observing at just the right time here. There we are. I'll let the artwork go in favor of the constellation outlines so you can see what they are more easily. As we mentioned before, there's Leo the lion you can see here. Gemini, of course, is way over on the eastern side of the, on the western side of the sky where we pointed out where Mars is. And of course, we can see where Buotes is up here, getting higher toward the top of the sky. Virgo is below or just behind Leo, if you will. And if we wanted to see Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, we have to crane our neck up higher so we can look up toward the top of the sky where we'd see that constellation that we know so well, the Big Dipper here in Ursa Major and Ursa Minor directly above that. And you can even turn around to face north to see that, to make that a little bit easier to see. So this map that I'm using, stellarium-web.org, is easy for you to access. And of course, you'd be able to use this without any difficulty at all. I'm just going to bring our sky back down here. So we're looking out toward the western side of the sky. There we are. I'll stop the screen share, and we'll see if there's a couple more questions before we're done for the evening. Let's see if we have a couple more questions for you. How's it going there, Linda? What do you have? It's going pretty good. <laughs> Okay, well, while she's digging that up, here's the next thing we're going to do. Remember earlier, I mentioned a little bit about being able to see some satellites. One of the uh, uh, programs that I like to use for seeing satellites uh, is this one. And uh, I'm going to share my screen once more so that we can see this a little bit easier here. Let me just get my screen share together here. There we go. Okay. This is called, uh, this is the website called See a Satellite Tonight. If you search, see a satellite tonight. What you'll come up with is uh, james.darpinian.com. You don't have to remember that. Just look for see a satellite tonight. And when you see that, that will give you this opportunity to see what satellites are available for you to see in your neck of the woods, where you live. At the bottom of this panel right here on the left, you see where you can change your location. And I've set this up for my location. And what I have here is I have first a spacecraft view looking down on the planet 
that shows where International Space Station is crossing the sky relative to where I am, okay? On the right-hand side, what I have is a sort of like a Google Street View of right where I live, showing the houses on my street, the trees on my street, and the sky over my street, so I know which way to look to see the satellites I'm looking for. Now, the panel on the far left, that uh, panel that shows the blue and gray squares, well, that shows you what's available to be seen at different times tonight. So for me, where I am, at 927 this evening, if the sky were clear, here's what I could see. I could see the dots of the Starlink satellite group moving over my location or near my location at that time. But then I can see on the right panel where in my neighborhood I would look to see those moving across the sky. I can even actually adjust this up a little bit so I can see more of the features of my neighborhood so I know exactly where to look to see these satellites. And of course, again, on the far left, you'll see the number of different opportunities for objects that can be seen. Cosmos is a Russian rocket booster. And if we look a little bit further along to 949, there's another pass of the International Space Station, but it's very low on the horizon and very difficult to see. So that's a really cool. One. All right, I'm gonna stop my screen sharing. We have time for uh, one more question. Let's see if we can squeeze in. Uh, we'll see if we can squeeze in a few more questions. Michelle wants to know, why can you see the moon in the daytime? Michelle, that's a great question. Why can you see the moon in the daytime? Well, Michelle, the moon orbits the Earth. And because the moon orbits the Earth, light reflected from the moon, sunlight reflected from the moon is visible here on Earth, just like you see it in the evening sky. But when you see it in the evening sky, Michelle, you're seeing the first half of the moon's orbit around the Earth. So once the moon passes the full phase, the moon is rising now later and later and later at night. So it may be rising at say two o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning. Well, if it's rising at that time, it's gonna take six, eight, 10 hours before it sets. So that means it's gonna be visible in the sky. And if the moon is far enough away from the sun in the sky, Michelle, you can see it during the day. So right around this particular phasing of the moon, the last quarter phases and after that, you can usually see the moon high in the Western sky in the morning around 10 a.m. And in fact, Michelle, there's only a couple of days during the moon cycle when the moon is not visible at some portion of the day, either in the evening after sunset or in the morning after sunrise over on the Western side of the sky. Try it, check it out, Michelle, on the next phasing of the moon Starting on June 10th, you wanna make your first observation if you can after sunset on June 11th, and then see if you can follow the moon on the subsequent days after that and see how long you can follow it. And you'll be able to see, given that the sky is clear, that the moon is visible almost every day. Great question, Michelle, thanks. What's next? Mike wants to know the aperture of Galileo's telescope. Hey, Mike has a really interesting question about Galileo's telescope. What was the aperture? One of the things I say about that, Mike, is that any telescope you get today is better than Galileo's first telescope was. I mean, it has to be almost, right? Well, what was the aperture? Well, the aperture was under an inch. It's only about that big, not very much at all. It was a very, very small lens, a very small lens, surprisingly smaller than you would expect. You probably thought it was a bigger lens. No, nope, it wasn't at all. It was actually quite small. And it took Galileo a lot, I mean a lot, to pull together the images he needed to make those sketches of the moon that you saw in Galileo's book, Sidereus Nuncius, that, uh, that Jay showed us. It really did take a lot for Galileo to put the images together in his head in order to draw them because he could only see a very small portion of the moon at a time. So he did incredible work with an instrument that was, wow, wow, a, a new invention in a sense, not all that good, uh, but he improved the telescope as he went along and made it much better. So by the time a hundred years later, it was a much, much better instrument, but thank goodness he put it together when he did. What's next, Linda? Sherry would like to know, what does the term solar minimum and solar maximum mean? Oh, Sherry, great question. What do the terms solar minimum and solar maximum mean? Well, these refer to those portions of the cycle of the sun's activity when the sun has a lot of sunspots or very few sunspots. So solar maximum 
is when the sun has a lot of sunspots on the surface, there's a lot of mag uh, magnetic activity happening on the surface and in the atmosphere of the sun. Solar minimum is when you have very, very few sunspots and very little magnetic activity that you can easily readily see. So that's what those two mean. Uh, we're just coming up to time, folks. Uh, I think we have time for one last question, then we'll be done. Let's do, uh, do that one, Linda, if you have one more. Uh, Sarah would like to know, when is the best time and the best way to see Mars with a home telescope? Sarah's asking a really cool question. What's the best time to see Mars? And with a telescope, where can you find it? Really very simple. If you uh, just use that star map that we pointed out here, stellarium-web.org, you'll be able to figure out when it's easy to see Mars with a small telescope. In the evening, just after sunset, look toward the west. You'll see where Venus is. Just go above Venus and a little bit to the left, and you'll be able to pick it out without too much difficulty. It's a great target for your telescope, even a small telescope. And uh, if you use that map, you'll be able to see your way clear of how to get to that location. Well, folks, I really appreciate you joining us tonight. We've had this great opportunity to talk about what's available to be seen in the night sky. We really want you to go out and take a look at the night sky and become familiar with the sky using some of the resources we've pointed out here. Uh, the stellarium-web.org is a really great one that you can use at home. And of course, you may realize already that there are any number of uh, star maps and um, star maps that you can find that you can use on your smartphone that will enable you to find your way uh, around the skies as you're outside where you are trying to find your way along. Uh, so if you sent us questions, if we didn't get to them yet, I'm going to dig through them as we get done with the program. I'll be happy to answer them for you. Very glad you could be with us tonight. We had a great time talking with Dr. Jay Pasikoff about the solar eclipse that's coming up next week. Now, that is Thursday, June 10th. The sun rises at 5.30 in the morning. The sun will already be in eclipse, 70% covered by the disk of the moon. And the eclipse is only going to last another hour. So by 7 o'clock, the eclipse is done and the sun is rising. So if you have an opportunity, you need to get yourself to a location where you have a clear view of the eastern horizon, a clear view of the eastern horizon, and a little bit north of east at sunrise at 5.30. So you better scout that out before next Thursday. Don't forget, you're also going to need this. If you have a solar eclipse viewer left over from 2017, you're going to need to use it in order to look at the eclipse directly. You will not be able to observe it without this. So make sure if you have one of these, you pull that out and you use it to see the eclipse. Okay, so uh, if you have other questions, please send them in. We'll be happy to answer them for you. Don't forget, that's next Thursday. You'll hear more about it as we approach that date uh, coming up. Uh, hopefully, we'll even have some special programming that will allow you to follow along with the eclipse as it's happening. So stay tuned on the Franklin Institute's website to hear more about that. But again, thanks for joining us tonight. Don't forget, the Franklin Institute is open. We'd love to have you come down and visit us. Of course, we have a modified museum experience that is designed to celebrate science in a safe and welcoming environment. We're still using masks at this point. That's going to disappear at some time in the not too distant future, but bear with us. We'd still love to have you. And of course, you can get advanced tickets online at the Franklin Institute's website, www.fi.edu. And you can check and see what all we have available for you to enjoy when you come visit us. So uh, make sure you check us out online for our other Franklin Institute at Home programs. Franklin at Home programs again at fi.edu. And you can follow me on Twitter. My handle is at Cool Astronomy. You can reach me there. Please do so. I'd love to hear from you. So remember, get out, look at the evening skies, and enjoy. Don't forget the eclipse next Thursday, but stay safe, folks. Thanks again. Don't forget to get vaccinated. And we'll see you next month in July. So thanks for being here with us. Nice guys at home. We'll see you again next month. So long, folks. <laughs>